All right. So we're here today with Steve Picataggio out of New York City. And we're here in my basement in Oshkosh. And you just happen to be in town with the four Phantoms performing here at the Grand Opera House and also filming a special for PBS, right? Yes. yes. Cool. So before we get into any of that, uh, can you just set us up with a little bit of your background, getting started with drums and how you've ended up where you are today? So I grew up in uh, Coral Springs, Florida, which is South Florida, very close to Fort Lauderdale. And I started playing drums when I was 10. Um, my older brother started playing before me and I followed in his footsteps. I used to watch him uh, practice and rehearse in a school band. Um, so I started in the middle school band program and you know all the way up through high school. And, and during that time, I got to play in the concert band, the jazz band. I got to play in, of course, like marching drum line in South Florida is huge. So I got really into that yeah. for a while. Um, but really the thing that I loved the most was playing in uh, the musicals. My high school fortunately had a really great band program, but also had a great theater program. So all the students would play in the pit orchestras every year. So that was like my first experience in playing a show or getting to be collaborative with other students. And, and through there, I just really fell in love with music and it kind of changed my life and kind of started to affect everything around me in a really positive way. And that's kind of when I realized I wanted to, you know, be a musician forever. Also through really amazing teachers and getting kind of to see their life as a musician and as a performer and a teacher. And I thought like, well, if I could just teach music all day and play, you know, drums at night, then I'd be like, you know, that would be making it for me. So um, fortunately, Danny Gottlieb was one of the teachers at one of the universities in Florida. So I ended up getting into the University of North Florida and studied with him there for four years and really dug into like his Joe Morello technique and really getting into, uh, you know, studying Mel Lewis and all the great big band drummers and, um, you know, went through that program and just knew for so long, for so many years that like, I want to move to New York and be a New York musician. But because I started playing musicals and playing jazz, I always loved doing both. Um, so when I moved to New York, I was like, well, there's Broadway and there's, the Village Vanguard, like, great, I could do both. Yeah. You know, I went to NYU for my master's the first two years of New York. So that was like, I studied with Billy Drummond and it was like really getting into his thing. And, you know, so the, the musicals, theater thing and the Broadway thing kind of was, you know, not as much at first. Um, but then I started doing a lot of like cabaret gigs um, and, and getting to play a concert with Broadway actors. So that was a nice little kind of in-between Thing for me and I've been doing a lot of that lately over the last few years and and still playing a lot of jazz music so it's really kind of like 50 50. Yeah and I think that gig specifically cabaret style shows um I don't have a ton of experience doing it and you can correct me if I'm wrong but it's like it kind of has this balance of the Broadway world where maybe things are very scripted and notated and specific but still having that spontaneity of being a live show where you have these vamps and have to be just ready to pivot at any moment. But it also has more of like the jazz feel where it's like, this is our collection of standards, which is different than jazz standards, even though there's a lot of crossover, but like you don't get music and you just have to be able to follow along yeah, and be more of a reactive in the moment without as much roadmap or instructions. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, that's, yeah, that describes it perfectly. And that's, that's a big reason why I like it so much. Cause it's like, it's, it's flexing a different muscle in some ways, but it's not in a lot of other ways, because I think like as drummers, we need to be good accompanists. Like that needs to be, that word needs to be used more, I think as drummers. Um, and regardless of style, you need to play with good time and good sound and read the music and have a good sense of the style you're playing. And, um, you know, playing a cabaret gig or playing a show, or even I play with a lot of jazz singers. So that kind of all is in a very kind of similar window for me. Yeah. Um, and I don't know, I, I found a lot of joy in just in, in playing in that way. And that has kind of allowed me to find this, this gig here that brought me here. Um, it's a concert on stage, so it's nice to be on stage. It's, it's also fun. I've done shows off Broadway and, some other things where I'm like down in the pit and I love that too. That's really fun. Sometimes it's nice to not be seen, but it's, it's also fun to do a concert and 
it's a gig, you know? Yeah, I always thought the disconnect with like Broadway musicians, like when I've gone to see shows where they do the touring Broadway shows here, it's like the drummer might walk out and say hi if we've gotten a chance to connect. And it's like no one in the, the, the hall even recognizes who it is or even saw them at any moment. And like they don't necessarily have to be dressed up in a tuxedo and be very formal or presentable. They're just in a hoodie with a yeah. backpack. Yeah. And I've even seen Broadway drummers like they're sitting there texting on their phone and, you know, having a snack in the middle of the show because they know that they have approximately five minutes until their yeah. next cue. When they really know the show that well, it's kind of it's kind of inspiring to just know the music that well, where you can kind of in, in my experience of like going and watching drummers um, and watching their book. Sometimes like we're chatting and it, I'm like, well. I'm cool chatting with you. Like, are you ready? Like, and they're ready. Like they're always yeah. ready. It's like, give me one second. And then they go and play. And <laughs> yeah. then they come back and chat with me. And it's like, wow, that's, it's amazing to just like, you know, the thing about like playing eight shows a week is like, well, how do you, don't you get bored playing the same thing? And it's like, well, the routine and, and, and really knowing the music that deeply, you know, is like, I think it's amazing. You know, I had an opportunity in college to tour with this show choir over a summer and we played the same show the same way every day, but just in a new city. And it's like, I kind of learned the hard way. I was a little dismissive about the challenge of playing the same thing and not getting to adjust the fills because that would mess up the dancers or something. And it's like, there's a different challenge in being able to play a show with that precision accuracy, but then also have the mastery of it where you can hold a conversation and then just like, yeah. oh, I have to play a triangle cue. Yeah, hold on. Yeah. You know? <laughs> okay, the song's starting. I have to look over here on this screen and stuff. It's like, it's a special art form. And I've always enjoyed like in Modern Drummer Magazine or something as a kid, seeing like the pit setups mm. and reading those interviews specifically. Yeah. Just because it's very like, like you were saying, it's not on stage. So it's like more utilitarian. Mm. Stuff hanging from the ceilings and, you know, you don't have much space. So you put a thing here and a thing there. Yeah, it's really fun. So it's kind of cool that your paths of like loving jazz and then also loving playing in that kind of musical mm. Broadway setting yeah. have kind of converged now in the show you're doing, right? Yeah. When I learned this show, it had already existed. And so I had reference in terms of like learning it. and But it was loose enough and open enough in terms of like, I've been doing the show now over two years and now I feel like I'm starting to build a lot of ownership over it rather than just, oh, I'm, this is the song, I'm going to read it note for note, play it. It's like, how can you build, you know, within the confines of of who you're playing with and, and why, you know, the intentionality of it, of course, but like, how can I make this stuff mine and, and play it in a way that's so musical, you know? Um, I think that's often overlooked because it's like, well, I don't feel very artistically fulfilled to do this or that. And it's like, there's art, no matter what you're playing, it could be musical and it could be your art, you know, because it's you yeah. playing it. For example, Ella Fitzgerald is my favorite musician of all time. And I've checked out a lot of her records, especially her live records. I love all of her drummers. Gus Johnson is one of my favorite drummers. Uh, the, you know, Tommy Flanagan and Paul Smith, the piano players, um, Oscar Peterson, of course. When you listen to all those live records, it's like there's a lot of similarities musically in all of, in all of those recordings. You yeah, even I mean? like to the degree of not the way she phrases the melody or the head, but like even her scat singing and some of the structure of those solos, it doesn't follow the cyclical form. Yeah. And she like has these elements that she's always going to hit a lot of uh, very similar to the way like Art Blakey soloed where it's like he's always going to get back to this yeah. phrase every night, but yeah. like he puts things in a different order or lets some of the magic happen in the spot, but yeah. there's still a lot of structure of like where he's going to hit along the way. And I think yeah. she has that too. And it's to me, that's why I like, like that's what I love listening to. That's what I like playing. I like that feeling of like, we're all in this together. We, we kind of know where we are in a way that th that's also not like stale and rigid and, and, and like kind of tense. Cause sometimes, you know, I'm sure you have too, but sometimes you play with somebody like it needs to be this and only this yeah. in this way. And that's, that's tough to do too. But if you feel like it could breathe also, but we also know where we all are and we also know where we're going. Um, I find that to be really fun. And, and that's kind of what this show has been. <laughs> yeah. And for people who don't know, uh, could you give a quick kind of recap of what 
the four phantom show covers so the four phantoms is um the four main actors have all been the phantom um in phantom of the opera on broadway and it kind of was created to have them all uh, perform together but also feature and kind of highlight like songs from other shows they they other shows they've been in so we play a lot of you know shows from uh, songs from chicago or songs from you know a variety of broadway shows and uh the portion that is music from phantom is probably maybe in some ways the smallest section of the show but when we get to that it's cool to see like all four of their kind of versions of it because they were all the phantom either on broadway or like the broadway tour or you know in canada or in you know the west coast or you know so there's like their own version uh, of it so it's cool to kind of see that come together um and then there's there's a fifth actor who sings she comes out and sings all the the christine stuff so when it's sure, all yeah. the the real like heavy hitting phantom stuff it's it kind of feels like the show in a way that's like like emotionally and musically but it's it's a concert version so for me to like be able to play these songs on stage and have to play um you know one actor has been here and there and you know playing their music it's a lot of reading it's a lot of different styles um and it, and it really moves you know it's like a 90 minute show but it's like yeah from beginning to end i don't i don't take there's not a I don't take a second off. It's like I'm playing on everything. And, and does it have more of a cabaret feel and less of staging and for sure dancing yeah. and that yeah. sort of props and such? The staging is minimal in a good way. I think it does feel more like a cabaret gig on a bigger stage. Um, and I think that's really, really fun because it's about the music. Um, and, you know, the band's right there with them. So it feels like we're all in it together. Um, sometimes you do these cabaret gigs or, or shows and you, there is that feeling of like they don't even see like the audience doesn't see us the performers don't even see us sometimes you yeah know? um <clears throat> but it's cool to to feel like you're you know all on stage together and um for me as the, as a drummer it's like a ton of reading i have the, i have a very cool setup you know a lot of cymbals and big drums and get to there's some moments where i just get to play as loud as i want yeah. And that's fun. <laughs> well, and I think that segues to a good point. Um, this is kind of a fly gig. You guys aren't yeah. on the road on a bus and like one night in this city, go to the next city. It's kind of more like we're going to go out for these four or five days and maybe we hit two different cities mm. back to back because mm. it's just more economical or that's when the dates worked out. But I think um, fly gigs in general, it's like when I was growing up, the dream was to be touring on the road yeah. on the bus and new city and playing arenas every night. And the opportunities I've had to tour, it's like, that could be a grind. And mm -hmm. there's this sweet spot of like fly gigs really let you travel, but stay in one place oh, yeah. for a few days and get comfortable and not have the grind of like constantly going oh, city yeah. to city. Right. Absolutely. I consider myself an in-town guy, like in New York, I feel like there's in maybe in any scene, but especially in New York, um, there's in town musicians and there's out of town musicians. Um, and I'm definitely an in town guy. I would consider myself that I, I teach a lot in town. Uh, I have a family, I have a three year old daughter. I have, you know, my wife and I were both in the arts. So it's like, we're juggling a lot of stuff in our own lives in, in the city. Um, and we love living in the city. So I, I don't like to be gone too long. So a fly gig, specifically this gig is, amazing for me because i feel like i can i can go out on the road and experience <clears throat> that life but then i come home and i like continue my flow of life and i really love that and and the joys of being able to go out for a few days and maybe sit in a spot play maybe play two gigs in one city or you know play a gig drive to the next town that's maybe an hour maybe maybe two away um that doesn't feel like this huge, like I'm out on the road. I don't know. You could probably give a better example than me, but like when I was touring on a bus, it's like we might drive eight hours, wake up and the bus driver, dedicated job is going to drive us. And we might get into a city at four o'clock and be able to check into our hotel, which is like right off the highway, not within walking distance of anywhere cool. And then at five o'clock, we're heading over to the venue to set up and sound check and play yeah. a show that night. And then we get done and pack up and we get back to the hotel at like 10 o'clock. Maybe we try to find a bar close by yeah. or a place to get a pizza. Yeah. 
And then we wake up and maybe if we're lucky, we don't have to leave till 10. Yeah. You know, there's definitely that there's, there's, there's a lot of versions of this. Sometimes you're staying off the side of a highway and, but it happens to be five minutes from the venue and then you get to the venue and it's beautiful and there's a little main street. And for me, I'm always trying to find a coffee shop. Like every, I look at the schedule and I'm already kind of, you know, on Google maps, like saving, okay, there's a coffee shop here. There's a coffee shop here. There's a restaurant here. There's a, a drum shop here. There's a drummer in town, something yeah. that I could at least like, yes, I have to be, uh, you know, this is the hotel. Yes. I have to be at the venue at this time, but there's that other thing that I could at least like also like have to look forward to, you know? Um, but it is really fun and really cool when you're like in a town you've never been in before. And you're like, wow, this is amazing. The hotel's cool. Maybe you could walk to the venue. Um, you know, you can, which means you can get there early. You don't have to get picked up and you can get there early and set up your drums and kind of get, you know, feel the vibe of the space. And, you know, maybe there's a cool place to check out. You know, I love New York so much. There's so much to do in New York, but as soon as you leave New York, you realize there's so many other cool areas, you know, in the country, in the world. Yeah. Um, and it's really fun to, uh, get to at least stay in a place for at least a day to kind of experience that. Yeah. And I think that like inherently comes with flying is cause like, yeah, driving is dependable for the most part other than like traffic, but flying is very volatile in terms of like delays and things working out. And I don't know if all of you guys that are involved with the show live in one area, but when I was doing fly gigs, it's like most of them were out of Minneapolis. Mm -hmm. The music director was in Louisiana. So it's like, they'll just find flights that get us all to X city yeah. sometime on Thursday because Friday is when we load in and rehearse. Right. So it's like, you have to leave these larger pockets of times. And for a lot of those venues to fly you in, it's like, well, we need to try to do more than one show right. to make enough revenue for it to be worthwhile with the travel. Right. So it's like, then you get those opportunities to spend some time and try to connect with someone or see a cool place. And I always looked forward to that too, of like, yeah. what's cool in this town? Because sometimes I would just bring a bunch of work and lock myself in my hotel room and do that. But yeah, it's a lot more fun to get out and do something yeah. and see a place. Yeah, it's it's. I think that's why I... I do this. I think that's why I'm really like attracted to the life of a musician of, of the people you get to meet and the places you get to go and the experiences. And of course, you know, you also go get to sit at the drums and play a fun concert. Um, yeah. But the, the collaborative aspect of it and the experiences around it are like, for me, it's, it's why I do it you know, to get to do something like this is, is amazing. I mean, I think my, my goal when I first moved to New York was like, if I could play one gig this year, I did it. And, you know, I, I played a ton of gigs and some good, some less good, but you know, you, you get to just kind of, you know, experience it as it comes and then kind of build and, you know, evolve and grow and in a cool way. Yeah. Yeah. And like you were saying, another good perk of like doing this fly gig where it just might be four days here and then I might be back in town yeah. for two weeks or, even two months, you know, yeah. depending on the theater cycles and stuff. But it's like, you don't have to disengage from being part of your scene. And right. like, especially in New York City with such a thriving scene for jazz and, yeah. and Broadway. It's like when I would tour full time, I would try to tell people, hey, I'm going to be back October 1st. <laughs> like, do you have anything that you could use a drummer on? And it, it was always, oh, just just let me know when you're back. I'm like, well, this is when I'll be <laughs> yeah, back. Yeah. Okay, just hit me up when you're back yeah, though, yeah. and then we'll get together. Yeah. So it's like you'd miss your window to like stay active in your scene. So I think for you, it's like you probably sometimes don't even, you've learned not to even tell people you're on the road. Yeah. Sometimes it's like maybe uh, tell them when you're back or, or be really like, like, um, hey, I'm gone from this day to this day and I'm back on this day. And hey, like, I don't know if you have anything going on, but like already kind of people, you know, people, assume it's nothing, you know, nothing against there's a lot going on and people are just like, Oh, I assumed you weren't available or I assumed you were still out of town or I assumed whatever it may be. And you have to just always, uh, keep everything up, you know, in, in terms yeah. of just like, uh, you know, that energy, the back and forth, the exchange of energy is like, people don't know, like, unless, unless you tell them, you know? So let's talk about, life in new york too because that is obviously like the epicenter yeah of jazz and broadway two fields yeah. that you're kind of entrenched in but what is your 
normal week, although I'm sure there's not really a normal week in the scheme of being a musician, but yeah. what is a normal week or month? What are the different things you kind of balance your time with there? Yeah, I've been in New York 12 years and it is bizarre to think, but um, it's it's grown to be, um, uh, I have a three-year-old daughter, so my routine starts early um, in the day these days, you know, so very early mornings, getting her ready for school and um, taking her to preschool. And then I teach um, at uh, two different private schools in the city, um, both that have really awesome, uh, pretty involved music faculties, a lot of concerts and lessons and classes. So I teach percussion ensembles and private lessons at both of those schools. So on any given day, I'm at, at one of them. From there, I'll either like run home and um, continue, you know, in dad zone and um, and then maybe run to a gig at night after like, you know, put her down to bed. My wife will get home and I'll sometimes immediately run back out and go to a gig. Those are kind of extreme days. They end up being really long days. Thursdays and Fridays, I teach adjunct at uh, Texas A&M Kingsville. So it's like my it's my third year teaching uh, at a university. My students are all online. So I dedicate like Thursdays and Fridays to teaching them uh, through Zoom. Um, and then, you know, all the gigs and rehearsals in between. I play a lot of straight ahead jazz gigs and like hotels and restaurants and, you know, jazz clubs in the city with a variety of um, musicians. And I play with a lot of jazz singers. And then I play with a lot of Broadway actors and the cabaret thing. And occasionally, you know, I'll have weeks like the last few months. It'll be I'll teach Monday through Wednesday. And then Wednesday night, I'll head to the airport and fly out and do a Four Phantoms gig for a few days, get back Sunday night, wake up Monday and, you know, start my teaching routine all over again. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that is awesome. And that totally sounds like what I would expect life in New York. Just yeah quick anywhere and and be ready to move on to the next thing at a moment's notice. Yeah. And it's, it's really taught me how to like prioritize my time and be in the moment. you know, I'm either like I'm teaching a lesson or I'm playing a gig or I'm in a rehearsal for somebody. And then I have to go immediately pivot to another thing. And it's kind of that, like whatever is directly in front of me, I have to just give my attention to. Yeah. Um, and it's it's been kind of cool to find kind of my space in all of it. You know, there's a lot of different avenues. You know, in New York, there's even within straight ahead jazz, there's a lot of avenues within that. Um, and just finding your people and finding the people you connect with and gel with and, you know, you enjoy playing with and they enjoy playing with you. And, you know, that kind of thing. Sometimes you play with people and you're like, this is amazing. Like, like how have we how have we never met before? Like you're, you play all the tunes I play, you speak my life. Like it's all, yeah. how are we just meeting? You know, that kind of thing that happens sometimes. Um, and sometimes you play with people like, okay, that was cool. Sometimes you play with people that you love and the music's awesome, but it's not a lot of money, but do it because who, who knows what can come from it. That's how this, that's how this four Phantoms gig started. I yeah. was playing with uh, an organization that uh, puts on these choir festivals. So like, couple times a year at Carnegie Hall, I'll bring my drums in and accompany a choir. And the music director for Phantoms, Ryan, also works for this group. And I played a little something on brushes, just some, I don't know what it was, one tune on this concert. And he's called me for a few things here and there along the way. And he asked me to do a gig with two actors from Wicked. And it was like, can you do these like 10 gigs? And some were in surrounding areas of New York more or less and at the end of that kind of run of shows I like learned so much about how to accompany and how to play in this setting where it was like marrying those two ideas of like okay it's not a show but it's also not just a gig it's kind of that in between you know and I really learned how to be in the moment in those gigs and then from there he called me to do um, Four Phantoms and when he called me for this it was like we're looking for a drummer to be in this group. It's an amazing feeling to like be a part of a thing and work towards this, you know, vision. You know, it's it's really fun. I try to do that even in small situations where it's like, okay, we have one rehearsal and one gig. Like let, let's grow this to be as musical and great as it possibly can. And then, you know, when the gig's over, you move on to the next one. But to yeah. to grow it for like over two years, it's been really 
really exciting and very liberating too to feel like I don't have like the book memorized ish, but I'm I'm really like zooming out a lot these days and and feeling like I can you know kind of lead when it's time to lead and and know where everyone kind of is and it's yes. a lot of fun for yeah. a drummer yeah. One other topic I wanted to bring up because I think drummers love to talk about gear and drums. Yeah. Um, and with your situation, both in New York and with doing these fly gigs is a lot of times you don't have the opportunity to bring much of your own equipment, if any, yeah. other than sticks or something, yeah. of course. So uh, let's start with kind of the fly gigs and the process for working with backline and your attitude and adjustments you maybe have to make to just make it work. Cause I'm sure you don't get everything you ask for, but it's it true. starts with the rider, right? Starts with the rider. I built a rider like years ago just to have. And, um, when I got this, when I got four phantoms, there was a rider already made. They sent it to me like, Hey, this is the rider we have, like tweak it however you want. I kept a lot of it. I, you know, I like to have, you know, a, a 12 inch Tom and a 16 inch Tom and a 20 inch bass drum and like a five by 14 snare drum. I love Yamaha drums. That was already on there. I was like, great. Like, who doesn't have Yamaha drums? Accessibility is a big part of it, right? Huge. I've and been like, asked to do backline where they ask for very niche boutique yeah. brands. And I'm like, how are you going to get what you want? Like, no. give me two brands and one of them, please be Yamaha. Yes. Yes. I've had some non-Yamaha drums and sometimes they're fine. And usually I'm like, I'd rather the Yamaha drums. Just in, especially for this gig, playing in a theater. You know what you're going to get. Hardware is amazing. Like Yamaha hardware yeah, it's is the indestructible. Best. So easy. It makes the cymbal sound great. The those tom mounts. Yeah. You have tom so you have tom mounts on your on the kit I built. I used Yamaha tom Yamaha mounts because it's like when you do the other ones, or especially with suspension brackets, it's like you place it and then it falls a little bit because of the bracket. And I always recommend it whenever I get a chance to work with schools and they ask me what should we get for a drum set. I'm like, well. You your kids will not be able to break the Yamaha stuff. Never. There are plenty of other good brands if you want this or that. But yeah. Like, this is indestructible. I get the Yamaha drums like 90% of the time, um, which is great. Easy to tune. And there's some percussion stuff I need, you know, wind chimes and wood blocks, the rolling pad that triggers some of the really iconic yeah. Phantom of the Opera music. Um, the drum, like the Roto Tom sound and some timpani stuff. I also like put. Really, I, I want these heads. They need to be new or somewhat new. But I, not I, pretty much. I always get new heads, which is great. Tune them up easily, um, and then I ask, which is kind of new for me coming out of the more jazz thing, is like I want these symbols, <laughs> and I pretty much, pretty much get the symbols that I want. Um, and if I don't, I I just try to make it work. Like I'm really easygoing. There's been a few times where it was like, okay, not even close, but you know, it is what it is and you make it work and you might adjust, you might remove a symbol or you might change the setup a little bit. Um, for this gig in particular, it's as long as I have at least the one crash <laughs> that could do all the, all the main crashes and could do some suspended symbol rolls and then I'm fine. But generally I get exactly what I want or very similar. The last, the last few gigs I brought my own symbols just cause we're doing this filming and, uh, recently became a, a, a zildjian artist so it's i brought all my zildjian symbols and it's nice to like night to night have the exact same symbol setup um yeah and it's been really fun you learn to appreciate like little things and uh yeah. and then you probably learn like what are the maybe not an inconvenience but what are the things worth bringing even if it might be a small burden of like here's a pouch of muffling tools that any drum that's not going to sound good i can quickly fix it i bring a miller machine with me which I mean, every Broadway pit has at least like three to five Miller machines in there that suspend a triangle, put it on like an LP um, mount on a cymbal stand, and it's just right there when I need it. A few times, this has happened a few times where they're like, oh, yeah, we have one of those. Like, whoa, cool, good to know. But most times, backlines don't have that. So I bring it's a, it comes in a little, I'm really obsessed with little bins and pouches, and everything has a place. I mean, yeah, you know, similar to your your studio, too. yeah, yeah. <laughs> which I'm like, you know, so inspired by. But just to have a the little pouch of like, this is the stuff. If anything goes wrong, I have a clutch. I have washers. I have felts. Like, I have my Miller machine. Like, I have my triangle. I bring like a little, <clears throat> um, 
like LP, really nothing um, woodblock mount to that goes on the bass drum. It's nothing. It doesn't take any room in my bag. Um, and sometimes they're like, oh, we don't really have like a woodblock thing. Or we do, but it's like this. Yeah. Why? And it's like, okay, I'll just put mine. It's fine. <laughs> you know? I find um, a lot of backline companies, I'm always impressed by how they take pride in like collecting and building their, you know, warehouse of different things they can offer. Like, oh, I don't have a, a six by 14 yeah. wood snare, but I have a five and a half. I'm like, in my mind, it's like, that's virtually the same. Yeah. That's fine. But it's cool. They take that level of care, but I don't know if they have that same level of detail when it comes to like percussion and accessory, yeah. things like that yeah. and mounts and stuff. And it's like, a lot of those mounts are just like, you find the perfect one that works for you and yeah. fits if you want to mount it off a hi hat or a bass drum. It's like, if it's not that hard to bring, don't try to burden yeah. those companies into yeah. needing your exact and, perfect scenario. I mean, for me, at least I'm, I'm all about like good vibes. Um, so to show, to show up somewhere and it not be exactly what you want, at least I have the things that, well, I didn't expect you to have this. I have it. It's fine. No big deal. Or, okay, you only have these stands. Um, that's cool. <laughs> you know yeah. what I mean? I'll make it work. It's cool. Um, well, I think that helps too with like, if you ask for 20 things and they get 10 of them, but they're all 10 minor things that don't improve your life. I'd rather ask for five things and get four of them, but it's having coded drum heads, yes. having the right size drums. Like, okay, the brand wasn't perfect, but they're the right size. It's yeah. like, okay, I'll yeah. live with it for two nights. Yeah. I got a, I got a couple of weeks ago in the, in the symbol bag, it was like, supposed to be like a 20 inch crash and an 18 inch crash. And it was like an 18 inch crash and like two or a 22 inch, like super rock ride. I was like, okay, it's fine. And then I take the other one out and I was like, oh, this is also a ride. But it wasn't like a nice washy ride. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I made it work. It's fine. You know, it is what it is. Um, I don't think anyone noticed. Yeah. No, probably not. Yeah. I also got two hi-hat bottoms on that gig, which was like hysterical. <laughs> but again, no one notices that stuff with me. Like we were saying, it's like, don't ask too much and be flexible. And I think yes. I almost like get excited about that. You know, I'm in the, a position playing more locally where even at some places who have a house kit, I could bring my own, but getting older i don't want to haul that around or like maybe i have it set up down here for teaching so mm. then it would be a burden to and it gets to take very, out of here it gets very cold here too yeah if you don't have to move anything then don't i want it to be as quick as possible yeah. getting from my car into the venue yeah so it's like yeah i'll play a jazz gig on a big 22 12 16 and like it's fine and i also kind of get excited for the challenge of like how do i make sure i sound like me on these drums even without yeah every piece of the puzzle that i think I accept my sound. I so agree with that. I, I think there's times, there's like months at a time where I haven't taken my drums out and I'm only using uh, backline drums. I'll bring my cymbals. Sometimes I won't even bring my cymbals. Um, and it's fun. It's a fun challenge. You're right. And then there's times where the drums live on my cart next to the door and I'm taking them on the train every day, every day, or, you know, few times a week i'm only using my drums and that's fun too because the more your drums are moving around and you get to kind of like oh this is different i got to tune my drum a little differently i have to deal with this setup or that setup um that makes your drums like you know come come to life a little bit more too so it's nice to have both you know yeah before we wrap up talking about gear let's talk about i know in new york it's like pretty standard place to have kits available but a lot of times they aren't maintained well or you play places that don't have it and you're yeah challenged with bringing that with you and do you have a car nope in the city okay so nope. you're always kind of relying on like what can i carry around my back or on a cart or in a subway yeah. or in a yeah. taxi so uh what has been your strategy or what have you kind of developed with your equipment to be to make that work my first gig in new york city i had old right reg regular hardware you know double braced stuff i put it in a hardware bag i was like oh, all my hardware fits in this bag perfect I had my snare drum here and my cymbals on my back. And I did, I just brought that. I just, it was like a little gig. And that alone, carrying it all, going on the train, it was like rush hour, the trains were packed. I immediately was like, okay, I need to figure out something that works better. The drum shop in New York City, Steve Maxwell's, now it's called Good Hands, but at the time, they posted this video about 
being able to find old hardware that could fit in the in a bongo case. I was like, perfect. I'll do that. So I got a bongo case. I found old hardware that would fit, and um, and I. It, that was like the beginning of it, of, of figuring out how to make the smallest, lightest, easiest to move setup. So then I got a, a, a good cart that ended up not being a good cart. So I got, okay, that's not the right cart. Evolved to another. I found an amazing cart that I've had for a long time. Okay, this is the cart. Great. It comes with bungees. Perfect. Um, then I found a 16-inch old Ludwig field drum from the 50s. And I bought it on eBay for $60 and I built it into a bass drum. That's been my main bass drum for everything in the city. The, the most current version of, of me taking my drums, mostly on the train. Um, but if I need to throw it in the trunk of an Uber or something, I could do that for a cab. I could do that too. Um, it's a 16 inch bass drum. And then I put my, um, you know, five inch snare drum on top of it. And then I got a, uh, what is it, like a 18-inch bag to fit my 16-inch bass drum. So I put both of those drums in one case and my seat, the seat top. Uh, so that's in one bag. Boom. One thing. Three things in one. Great. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> and then I have my hardware in a bongo case and my cymbals on my back. And I strap it all into a, my cart and I take it on the subway. <laughs> yeah. One trip. <laughs> one trip. The thing that I love the most is like for a while, my rug was the heaviest thing I had. So I got these little mats that just are the size of the pedals. Okay. And so even if I don't bring a bass drum, I have one little mat just for the hi-hat. And then if I have everything, I have a mat for each. It's been awesome. And I could take it everywhere. And I've used it for a lot of like hotels, restaurant gigs. I'll use it for, but I've, I did like two off-Broadway shows with the 16-inch bass drum. I've played on like outdoor big stages, concerts, and I, I bring the 16 and oh, that's such a cute little bass drum. I was like, wait, yeah. till, wait till you hear it. And they put a mic on it and they're like, oh, that sounded really good. It's like, yeah, it's a I bass drum. I had the same experience where for a long time, I just did everything on my little Catalina kit. And mm -hmm. if I need to throw a mic in the bass, anytime I need the bass drum to be louder, it's probably going to be mic. So yeah. it's not my problem. Yeah. It just matters if it, tonally sounds how i want or need yeah. to yeah you could do a lot with a little and i've yeah. like you i've kind of played many wine bar gigs where it's like i could bring my toms but i think aside from just having everything take more space i think there's a tonal difference when you use you know if i play my snare drum with three toms and four metallic cymbals around it there's a lot of reflection yeah and sympathetic tone that you probably don't even hear but it makes the snare drum sound louder and I've kind of found that when I play just a two-piece kit with hats and one cymbal, it's like it's already quieter mm -hmm. just because there's not as much reflecting yeah. the sound to start yeah. with. And like sometimes visually, if you're playing like like a private event <clears throat> and you come in with all this stuff, even though we know as drummers that doesn't that doesn't mean you're gonna play loud or soft, having a lot of stuff, of course. But sometimes just visually to have this little this little kit that works for the space, it, it, it goes a long way. It, it's, you know, the, the leader of the event or whatever is usually very appreciative of like, wow, you just made the space work so well. It's yeah. funny too, is I used to think the opposite of that, that like, wow, this person's paying a lot of money. And it, yeah. I don't want them to think that I don't care and like just brought a snare drum yeah. and ride. Yeah. I've never had a event host or coordinator, you know, think that we were phoning it in because right. we didn't bring enough gear. Yeah. How can I make this space work? You know, um, how could I play full, which is not loud, that's just full, and 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 still fit in the, um, you know, in an appropriate space, you know, musically and physically. I think my favorite player that I admire for brushes is Ed Thigpen. The best. And I consider Ed Thigpen to be like the ultimate accompanist. Like he played with Ella Fitzgerald too and Oscar yep. Peterson trio. That was a big thing for me when I was in high school. I heard a live Oscar Peterson trio record and you hear like silverware, cla you know, clanking and yeah. you hear people having conversation and then uh, the trio is playing like a dinner set. Do you remember what album that was? Yeah. Live at the London house. Okay. Um, they play, the first tune is this tune called Diablo, which is kind of like, it's like this Latin thing. It, it's so, it's so distinct to me because like 
the record starts with Ed Thigpen playing on the bell of the cymbal. Um, and then the bass comes in and it's just so acoustic and so clear. Obviously, they're all probably like, you just imagine like a bunch of people eating dinner, the trio's playing in their tuxes. And for me, that's like the height, you know, of music in a lot of ways. And anytime I'm in those situations where I'm playing like a hotel gig or like a, a private thing for a dinner and it's kind of that vibe, I'm always like, yes, this is it. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> My uh, like pivotal life changing album was Oscar Peterson trio plays West Side Story. That's for me, record. that's like, that's a great record. A lot of it feels through composed, even yeah. though there are improvisational elements. So like we were talking about with the cabaret thing, it's like, it's not really the jazz spirit and not knowing where it's going to go, but it's not dictated. Yeah. You know, it's going to be this long yeah. or anything. So Red Garland is one of my favorite piano players. And I think people call him a cabaret pianist, which is hysterical to me because it's like, first of all, so what? And second of all, that's like quintessential jazz piano right there. You know, yeah, so but if I went to go see Red Garland, I'd want him to do all the Red yeah. Garland isms and yeah. things. Like I'd almost be disappointed if he like, was like, I'm feeling different tonight. Yeah. And I think a lot of those old musicians get that performing a lot. There's a, a mindset in jazz culture today, which I don't think is everyone. And I'm not, you know, being too negative, but like where they always feel like they're up there for themselves and to kind of express. And I appreciate the musicians who like know why people want to see them and mm. want to make the experience good for me and, and let me see all the things about him yeah. in my love, you know. Nat King Cole's another one that I I love him so much and I love his music so much. No matter what he's doing, he was like a he kind of was like a pop singer for a while, you know, like yeah. just and and I think that's amazing. Uh, you know, obviously his trio stuff is so iconic, but when he was just standing up, not playing piano and just singing, it's like it was never not Nat King Cole, right? It was yeah, it was like insane, yeah. Cool. Well, yeah. uh definitely spent a lot of time talking today cool. <laughs> and uh thank you for spending the time to chat and before we sign off uh where can people kind of follow you and see what you're up to yeah um i'm active on instagram as much as i can um i try to post my gigs there and kind of also show like what i'm up to and uh, you know what venues i'm playing at either in new york or out of town and i do have a website steve drummer.com which is basically an extension of my Instagram and Facebook more or less, but it has some stuff there. Um, I would say Instagram. Yeah. Steve pick underscore drummer is, uh, is where I'm okay at the most. Yeah. And I followed it for some time and, uh, I love that you do a good job of, uh, posting. You've kind of given us a behind the curtain look at like, what is the back line like here or yeah. there, whether through stories or post and such, but yeah, it's been cool to see. Cool. So. Thanks man. Thanks for All having right. me, Mike. Yeah. yeah thank you. Thank you. <laughs>